forward. So everybody should have a ballot and should have a pen. And if you don't have a pen, I'm sure there's some in the back over, over there. But um, if you can vote for your favorite films, the, the, um, the best film uh, voted by the audience will win uh, a prize uh, from Nature. Um, and this is for the entire film festival. Uh, I also want to mention that after the panel, we also have a reception that's going to happen upstairs. So stick around for that. There's a bunch of free gifts from uh, Google. So you don't want to miss that. And also from Nature Magazine. And um, and without further ado, I just want to introduce uh, Alex Pasternak, who's the editor at large of Motherboard TV, and he's also an alumni of Imagine Science. I don't know if anybody has watched any of the videos on Motherboard TV or any of the news posts, but um, we feel very much in line with what they do. So, Alex, thanks so much for uh, moderating, and he'll introduce the panelist. Thank you. Thank you, Alexi. Congratulations. Hello, world. Um, we are uh, we are live at Google, New York, and we're here tonight, the first night of the Imagine Science Film Festival, the greatest science film festival in the universe, to talk about data and art and the way these things come together to help us understand the world better. And now is an especially poignant time and place to be talking about that, I think, um, not least because the number one movie at the box office is a movie about science. And despite some serious reservations about the rigors of, uh, of that film scientifically, um, I think it's, it's a pretty interesting achievement for science films. Um, it's also um, an important time because uh, we are at Google uh, right now, actually. We're in the heart of the internet as it exists in New York. So much data is passing through this building right now. Um, and Google is, with the exception of maybe a particular government agency, uh, in charge of more data in the world than anybody else, arguably. But also, we, we are now facing um, an interesting deficit in terms of scientific understanding and literacy. And um, I believe it was a Pew survey earlier this year that showed that 46% of Americans think that science and math are difficult to go into as, as careers because they're too hard. And I couldn't think of a better panel to come together tonight to discuss this problem and to discuss the ways that, that data and science and art collide. So um, if everyone can come up. Um, Tiffany, Tiffany Shane is a, is a filmmaker based in California whose ideas about the internet and culture have informed the Webby Awards, which she founded to identify excellence online. And her films like Connected, uh, which premiered at Sundance, and The Future Starts Here, which is a new series that starts today on AOL. Check it out. It's awesome. Aaron Koblin is an artist and designer who works with data. His work has appeared at museums around the world, and he's received the National Science Foundation's first place award for data visualization. He is a data artist at the Google Creative Lab, and he just made a fantastic music video for Arcade Fire, which is on the internet. Go check it out. Ali Brivanlu is a biologist at Rockefeller University who heads the Laboratory of Molecular Embryology. And his research focuses on molecular events and cellular interactions that regulate the emergence of key structures in the early embryo. Ali is also an architect who works at Columbia to identify new ways to combine biology and the built environment. So uh, please give them a round of applause. And um, <laughs> Ali, I'd like to start with you. You um, and the computer over there, I think, has the slides uh, slides on it. How did you get interested in architecture? Uh, I have to rectify. I'm actually not an architect. Okay. I'm extremely interested in architecture. I'm part of the architecture faculty at Columbia. And this is based on a very simple observation that most of the structures that are being built by architects around the world are very static structures. So you build a house or a building or a bridge and a tunnel, and it's always the same. In biology, we learn that things change form very quickly, aggressively sometimes. So the idea here is to combine the knowledge of biological system, natural system, to 
design structures that are no longer static and are endowed with dynamic motion and movement. There is no reason to think, for example, that a building cannot adapt to uh, environmental uh, issues and stress or adapt to the mood of the people who are living inside of it. And uh, I think it's time that one takes the lessons from evolutionary biology. Uh, I'm an embryologist from early development and apply it to human structures. Can you talk a little bit about how your work in biology helps to inform your thinking about making connections? And for instance, the, um, the ways that you visualize in science, how does that affect your work and how does that end up affecting your, your interest in bridging gaps with other disciplines? So um, the visual information in my world has really two components. Uh, what you see with your own eyes when you're sitting in front of the microscope or if you're looking at the sequence of a given gene or DNA, uh, the projections of that in your own mind, and then secondly, the way you display that information to people who are either scientists or not scientists, and how you convey the significance of what you see. I think the second part is uh, something that we are seeing on that screen. It has some aesthetic values to it. I was told, uh, as a scientist, I'm really interested in the data that I gather from it. But you cannot help noticing the beauty of what you see sometimes. It's the same feeling as when you look at the pictures of the Hubble telescope and you realize that you're seeing things that nobody else has seen, is invigorating and is stimulating. So uh, vision, may it be as images or movies or graphic reconstitutions, are part of my medium of expression. So this is the way we convey progress. This is the way we show what we have learned that we didn't know before. And as the techniques are moving forward and it's becoming more and more sophisticated, obviously science labs are adapting to it. The microscopes are getting better. The visual displays are getting better. And now we're in a world where we can have virtual reality as our medium to go inside structures that otherwise we could have never imagined looking at. Can you talk a little bit about some recent developments in visualization within biology, how that's changing the field and how it's encouraging maybe more interaction with other fields? I think the, the most important aspect of it is to uh, eliminate everything that's technical jargon so that the communication between a scientist and the people who are looking look at the information of the data becomes a more direct line and is no longer suffering from bumpiness or uh, a pseudo-intellectualism. I think the new way of expressing the information uh, in many different forms, we have four-dimensional softwares that allow you to recreate real si uh, situation in four dimensions, the three dimensions of the structure we're looking at, plus the fourth dimension of time, so things very dynamically. And these technologies are getting better and better, and that allows us to look at the resolution that we never had before. And I think that's what the architects are interested. It's not only the way things can dynamically change form, but also the way we can recapitulate those in a world that we're not necessarily bound by evolutionary boundaries or, or restrictions. Uh, the way life takes shape and the way natural shape change in contour and contrast is dictated by millions of years of natural selection that impose upon them a set of trait that they have to follow. If you compare a human embryo at early stages, you cannot distinguish it from a turtle, a pig, or a cow. Uh, there is an evolutionary pressure that maintains the early shapes the same, and then it diverges. In the world of architecture, you're no longer bound by this kind of restriction. You can just go out there, uh, eliminate the evolutionary pressure, and come up with ideas and designs that nature did not even use. That interface is also part of the expression and the image and videos that we use. And I think some of them, uh, I think there's a little video here that shows the work of the graduate students and the way they interpret biological information. Aaron, can you, can you talk a little bit about your work in terms of integrating art and data? Typically, science and data tend to be a non aesthetic experience but what is it what kind of challenges are you are you dealing with when you're combining these two sure would, would it be helpful <laughs> to show some yeah. yeah. if you yeah. sit like
Okay. Cool. I can just uh, start off by giving a little bit of context to some of the projects I've worked on uh, over the last several years. This is a project called Flight Patterns, which is already back from 2005, but it's basically looking at air traffic patterns over North America. So you see this daily ebb and flow being visualized. These are red eye flights mm -hmm. going to the East Coast and people waking up on the East Coast right there with European flights, everybody moving across the country. Eventually you see San Francisco, Los Angeles waking up there and, and going down to Hawaii in the corner. So a lot of the, the software that um, I've been playing with is different ways of using um, computational power to, to enhance communication understanding. Uh, and, and really oftentimes, some of the projects are about bringing the intangible into a tangible form. So growing up, I was also really interested in microscopes and telescopes and things that could enhance our ability to perceive. Uh, and now we have digital technologies that really allow us to see things that are not actually visible at all. Um, this is looking again at that data set uh, over time lapses. This one is an interactive map that lets you zoom into specific airports and see uh, altitude parameters being visualized. This is Atlanta, and you can see uh, basically high altitudes in blue, low altitudes in white, or you can toggle between make and manufacture and see uh, different, different patterns that form for different airports. How long did it take to put all that together? Believe it or not, most of the data visualization, um, most of the time that it takes to create these things is more in the politics and the, uh, <laughs> the, the meta work. The actual creation of visualizations is made quite easy by modern day software, things like processing, um, open frameworks, sender, things like that. So this, this actually f went from numbers in a spreadsheet to visuals in about two hours, uh, and then probably refined over the next couple days. When you when you mention politics, what do you what do you mean? Um, I mean many things. Um, this is this for context is actually a project I worked on. Um, for the MoMA here in New York with the Sensible Cities Lab at MIT. And we, we were able to get data from AT&T about their um, basically long distance phone call data as well as IP flow data that was subdivided into email and other things. In, in this case, it was actually easy to get the data because of the context when we went to AT&T and said, we want to do, do this visualization. Um, they, they understood it, but oftentimes it's quite difficult and, and sometimes potentially even dangerous to be uh, broadcasting certain types of data. Um, so there, there's kind of a lot of thinking that has to go into the immediate story and the tangential stories you might not even realize you're telling. Um, in, in the case here, we were actually able to subdivide the boroughs of New York and actually give a, an alternative perspective to the U.S. Census in terms of demographic information. This is the demographics as seen by the infrastructure of telephone calls, who's calling who where, for how long and when. Uh, there's really interesting tangential uh, information that comes from data sets when you cross-reference them as well. Um, I've done a, a couple other interactive tools. This one is looking at uh, SMS messages in the city of Amsterdam. So it allows you to rotate around, see again the daily ebb and flow of people texting each other. And here you'll see uh, New Year's Eve is about to happen where everybody says, Happy New Year, right there. Yeah. And you can see other events uh, like Queen's Day where everybody gathers in the center of the city and a number of other events play out. Um, this is a totally different take on data visualization. My, my project's kind of go lots of different directions. This is a, a physical visualization in San Jose International Airport. And it's basically using privacy glass, which are panels that turn from opaque to transparent with electrical current. And it's virtually traveling to different locations in real time around the planet. So you'll see here uh, in this display, it says it's about to go to Kathmandu. And then Kathmandu will light, light up, and you'll see the current conditions are light rain. It basically takes in uh, wind speed, wind direction, cloud cover, humidity, a number of different parameters that then visualizes abstractly through this cloud. It was really thinking about that space, how we could do something that was kind of not going to be super obtrusive. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll talk super briefly about this. This is Baron Wolfgang von Kempflin's mechanical chess playing machine, known as the Mechanical Turk. Um, and this was the inspiration for a web service by Amazon called the Mechanical Turk. Which basically, they, they, they call it artificial, artificial intelligence, which is <laughs> treating people like machines. Uh, and it, it's kind of this amazing service. You can just spit in a task, and it'll spit back whatever, you, wh whatever it gives you from human brains. Uh, and I thought this was kind of amazing and powerful and revolutionary, but also kind of dystopically horrible when we have no idea what we're doing and we're being mined for our brains by this big distributed system. So, but oscillating rapidly between those two poles, I decided to play around with it and ask people to draw a sheep facing to the left. And I said, I'll pay you two cents for what you create. And I started collecting a ton of sheep that I put online on a website called the Sheep Market, where they were then sold in blocks of 20, uh, which made a number of people quite irate. It was uh, kind of a, a commentary on this entire system. 
Um, I don't know. Should I, should I keep going or should we dive back and forth? Um, no, I mean, uh, that's great. And we can, well, we can go back to some of that stuff later. Yeah. Um, given, given your, your work at the Google Creative Lab, um, I wonder what your thinking is about the role that data plays in our lives now, especially uh, in the context of Google, um, and also at Google. What kind of what kind of role does stuff like this play in helping engineers think about what comes next? So I'm part of a group called the Creative Lab, which is mostly based here in New York, but I also uh, my team's in San Francisco. Uh, and we do a lot of thinking about communication, about um, ways to understand data, and also ways to think about how uh, how the communication between engineers, I, I, which I think is what you're really getting at, communication between engineers and products and marketing people. And really, to your point, I think what's exciting is a lot of there's a lot of bridging and a lot of rapid um, kind of barriers to communication that are falling falling apart. Uh, Luckily, uh, and, and and therefore we're we're getting some really interesting collaborations. So one good example, um, a Creative Lab project that happened um, fairly recently was with the Glass team. Uh, we we kind of talk about uh, approaching it from two different directions. You have engineers uh, and and technological developments that are happening quite rapidly, and sometimes you have a number of different science fictions that are being created. Uh, largely, uh, that's probably more the role of the Creative Lab. And at some point, th these two factors can start playing into each other and guiding towards each other. Uh, I think Sci Robert Wong, uh, who's also in the Creative Lab, talks a lot about how science fiction, uh, the role of it in guiding future, uh, future thinking and product design. So with Google Glass, it was largely about the technology finally reaching this point of um, being able to achieve a lot of amazing things, and then kind of questing for this future vision, not necessarily what's the product right now, but what could it be down the line. Um, and then it, in creating a video that basically would look uh, you know, a, a few years down the line, then the product itself was actually in some ways course corrected in a direct response to what that potential was through that science fiction. Um, and, and I think both of, you know, it's kind of a back and forth dialogue constantly, and that, that's that's a really healthy process. The idea that science fiction informs science and vice versa. Yeah, and I mean, obviously. we've seen that, like, historically uh, all the time. Uh, and really just this idea that science fiction provides an outlet for dreaming, uh, for global dreaming, and uh, exploring all the possibilities uh, before they become realities. Yeah. What What are some ways that you get inspired? And, I mean, how do, how do you choose the sort of projects or kind of data that you want to work with? Um, the, it comes from all over the place. Sometimes there'll be a particular data set that I notice that raises questions in my mind um, that makes me want to explore and investigate. Sometimes the software that I'm writing is more about uh, asking questions, and sometimes it's more about uh, noticing something and kind of communicating that uh, out, out of what's been noticed. Um, sometimes it's even about making data sets. So the sheet market is one of a, a number of collaborative online projects. I, I did another one with a friend of mine named Chris Milk. We did uh, It's called the Johnny Cash Project, where everybody's drawing a different frame of a music video that's constantly uh, building. Yeah, that's um, awesome. It, it's doing a lot of, like, creating data sets um, is also super exciting because you can use these role-based systems to then um, create something totally new that can also raise a lot of questions. Does being at Google give you special access to lots and lots of data? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no comment. No. No, it, it's a, no, I, I mean, so the, it, mostly it gives me access to a lot of amazing resources, especially human resources. But it also gives me access to, um, well, as I said, the, the engineers that are building the tools that I'm using. So oftentimes we're doing things with HTML5, JavaScript, stuff like WebGL, Android. Um, and there's a lot of open source technologies that we get to play around with and kind of even guide the course of sometimes through dialogue and conversation. So I think that's one of the major, uh, most one of the most exciting things about being here, uh, largely on the tool set side. But of course, there's lots of open APIs and, and other data sets, which are really exciting too. And now you have a quantum computer. I'm excited about that. <laughs> what are you going to do with that? Well, first I have to get access to it, but if I can, I, I, I think what's most exciting is what they were talking about, about not really knowing the best questions for it. Uh, that's incredibly exciting. I know in terms of optimization and traveling salesman stuff, like it's, it's going to be exciting to see how that applies to big scale data that, that's being messed with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can imagine some interesting visualizations coming out of that. Um, Tiffany, can you talk a little bit about your relationship with computers and maybe 
you can show some of your work, um, your film work? Yeah, but I want to start off that um, when I was growing up, my dad was writing a book called Art and Physics, Parallel Visions in Space, Time, and Light. So those were my bedtime stories because he didn't publish it. So I was 18, but he was trying out his talks and his ideas on his three kids as bedtime stories. <coughs> how many of you know of that book, Art and Physics? Yeah, so it talked about how um, he goes from the beginning of time on how artists and scientists are talking about the exact same ideas, but ones with images and ones with numbers. And it's a wonderful book. And so, and he also, and my mother's a psychologist, so she was always talking about the mind, and my father would bring like a human brain and formaldehyde to my fourth grade class. So surrounded with that kind of stuff growing up, and I think that really influenced all my films about brains and stuff. So I'm gonna show you some um, stuff. Wait one second. Um, okay. So we got sound here. Yeah. yeah. Remote. Is that showing? So that is me. I'm Tiffany Schlein. And um, I spent a lot of time thinking about science and how to visualize it and give it emotion. Because I think a lot of science is lacking emotion. And um, <clears throat> as a woman, um, I think that's one of the things that I bring to it. Um, I sometimes feel like this when I start a project where I'm just kind of trying to feel what's out there emotionally and what we're doing as a culture and society and how I can interpret all of that into something visual. Um, I actually was here a couple years ago showing my film Connected when it was in theaters. <clears throat> that movie is a lot about my dad um, and his ideas and my ideas in relation to them, and um, a lot about connectedness from the Big Bang to today. And um, I really was trying to come at connectedness from every way imaginable, mathematically, biologically, emotionally. Um, and I tried to do as many visuals as possible to get to why, what is our desire for connectedness? Um, I was given a Mac at 14, which had a big influence in visualizing everything, and I, I do a lot of uh, history, little animations in there that try to show the context of science. Um, this was a film that I finished last year called Brain Power, and I'm gonna just show a little clip of it. Um, and you can see. We go a little louder. A lot of us are wondering, what is all this technology doing to our brains? I mean, we know that the brain changes throughout life based on experiences. In fact, watching this movie is reshaping connections in your brain right now. But since we humans are the ones creating and using this technology, maybe a better question to ask is, how are we shaping our brains? I'm trying to show the brain in a new way with gyroscopes. <laughs> There's so much about the brain that we don't know. But there are some things we do know. You see, not long after we humans began thinking, hmm, we began thinking about ways to understand our own brains. One strategy thinkers have used throughout history is to compare the brain to the newest technology of their day. The brain is a clock, a switchboard, a steam engine, a machine, a computer. And we wondered, how can today's technology help us understand the brain in a new way? So we used that technology to ask people all over the world, how do you imagine the brain? It was amazing, like all these neurons firing ideas and images back to us from all over the world. I'm gonna, you know, they actually showed this film last year, so I'm not, you guys, might, some of you might have seen it. Has anyone seen Brain Power here at the festival last year? Okay. Um, anyways, and then um, I was asked to make a book about it, and I got to kind of think about how to explain brain neuroscience in a book, and I got to put videos in it because the TED books are iPads. For years. Oopsie. Oh, and I, I just threw in this film, it's a one and a half minute film. 
Um, I have to show it because when I watched that film about the singularity earlier, but it's, it's kind of, again, me, my way of showing my thoughts about the singularity. So. For years, experts have been predicting massive global changes. This trend in tipping points seems to be reaching a tipping point. But while people are worried about the end of civilization, have you noticed that your friend list is accelerating? You have three friends in common. You have 15 friends in common. You have 155 friends in common. You have 4,950 friends in common. You have 68,209 friends in common. You have 285,954 friends in common. You have 2,533,136 friends in common. first city where everyone will become friends? Portland, Oregon. Of course. Next will be Seattle, then San Francisco. It spread to Monte Carlo soon after, and the EU is predicted to make nice by January 2016. The trend will accelerate to other countries. There will be some resistance, but who wants to be left out? You have seven billion friends in common. Scientists are calling this the friendship. The point when everyone on Earth becomes friends. And you thought the singularity was a big deal. Um, I just had to show that after I saw The Singularity tonight. Okay, um, let's see. I have a new film series. I don't have time to show it, but it's all my looking at the past, present, and future. It's called The Future Starts Here. There's eight episodes you can watch now. It just premiered today. That's why I'm in town and for this. But um, <clears throat> I have an episode on um, uh, that you guys should watch if you're interested in visualizing science called um, Why We Love Robots. My husband's a professor of robotics at Berkeley and also an artist, and we made it together. And um, we try to really describe, A, the history of robotics and explain cloud robotics, which is what my husband believes is the future of robotics, in a whole bunch of different ways. So that would be a good thing for you guys to check out. We don't have time to show that. And the last clip I'm going to show you is a film I'm almost finished with. I'm just going to show a couple minutes called The Science of Character. And again, this is me attempting to bring emotion to neuroscience and social science. The clip at the beginning goes into the social science, but deeper in. It premieres this winter. Um, here it is. There are seven billion of us humans on the planet, and each one of us has a unique character. So what determines your character? You do, and all the people around you. And there's new science proving that if you focus on certain parts of your character, that that can lead to a more meaningful, successful, and happy life, no matter what your circumstance. I mean, who doesn't want that? We humans have been trying to figure out the key to a happy, meaningful life forever. Then in 2004, two psychologists published research about character that gave us a whole new framework to think about ourselves. They suggested that instead of focusing on all the things that can go wrong with us, it's also important to celebrate all the things that can go right. So they looked throughout history and identified six core virtues that humans have valued across cultures and across time. And then highlighted 24 character strengths that could lead to these virtues. And they organized them in a way that we could understand them better like scientists have done throughout history. I think I'm gonna stop it there because we don't have much These time. But basically, I, a lot of times I'm either taking um, science and trying to make it accessible and emotional. I use a lot of humor in my, I try to make science funny. Um, and other times I try to take social ideas and put them in a scientific framework, like putting all of the social characteristics of character strengths into a periodic table as kind of a way to think about it. So I'm constantly 
going back and forth um, to try to make science more accessible. So. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, you're <laughs> And thanks for breaking your, your technology Shabbat. I, I know, know normally I don't do anything tonight. I feel guilty. But. Um, you'll have to see one of her episodes about that. It's the first one. Um, can you talk a little bit about the the the, the difficulties you you face in in making in making the art as a filmmaker and making the art rigorous scientifically and making the the facts come through and making sure that the art is true to the science? That's such a great question because we we care about that. So I worked with all these neuroscientists at Harvard and University of Washington on this film Brain Power, which is all about all this new research on how to best nurture children's brains, and I compare it to how to best nurture the global brain of the internet. And getting that science right, we kept going back to them and meeting with them, and they said, gosh, we've had other filmmakers come, and they're very poetic with our research. And I'm like, I don't want to be poetic. I want to be right, and then add the poetry on top of that. And the robot film, obviously, Ken's a roboticist, so I was safe there. But I care about that. Like, it has to really appeal. And, and our films are shown um, at a lot of science conferences. And they're shown at a lot of places that wouldn't be. But we, ca I mean, I care. I, I think great mathematicians are artists. I mean. To me, it's just a way to look at it. And so I have such respect and for the integrity of the science. It's like just as beautiful. And that's the armature that I'm trying to visualize and make emotional and accessible. Mm -hmm. Ali, I know that you, you've done scientific work that, oh, sorry about that. You've done some scientific work that, um, that is somewhat controversial. And um, I'm curious to hear about that and to hear about how you think about the need to communicate science vis-a-vis -vis that kind of research. Yeah, so uh, I'm a stem cell biologist, and I work with human embryonic stem cells in my lab. We started this more than 10 years ago uh, under the Bush administration, and the socio-political environment at the time was not quite suitable to undertake this. And uh, I'm lucky to be at the university that's very supportive and can provide private funds, but it was a very nightmarish scenario where my lab had to be divided into two parts. One part where federal funds could be used to do research, and then the second part was only funded with private funds, so not to offend anybody in the administration or the government. And that might sound benign at the beginning, but the idea of changing lab coat when you go from one room to the other or putting your pipette down and grabbing another one on the other side is mind-blowing, and this is the kind of restrictions we had to go through. I think I'm, I'm lucky to have a group of people who are dedicated enough not only uh, about doing the experiments and answering questions, but to uh, really create a hierarchy of significance as to among all the experiments we can do in the lab, which one are actually the most important one, important one to do first. And it's with this spirit that we have always moved forward. And um, uh, this is a signature of basic scientists, those who do science without any obvious utilitarian outcome at the beginning to follow their heart. So um, scientists do have emotions and, and they're human beings and, and they feel very strongly about what is right and sometimes what is not right. Um, the controversy behind my work starts with working with human embryos, which is already a big taboo because uh, a lot of people define the definition of a human being as the moment of fertilization. I, I respect that. I have no problem with that. Um, but I also respect the opinion of people from different faiths and different beliefs that have tendency to define the origin of a human life as being at the time that's later than the moment of conception. And so balancing these arguments was very uh, a difficult thing to do. It took us about a year and a half of bioethic debates at the Rockefeller with a variety of uh, representatives of, of the society, uh, artists, writers, philosophers, uh, religious uh, figures. And we came up to a consensus that one should not be scared of doing what is the right thing to do. Um, this idea that scientists do experiments just to see what happens needs to be modified perhaps in the general public's perception. Um, uh, scientists are not Frankenstein. They're not trying to do things to scare people or just randomly connect electrodes to bodies and jolt dead bodies to come to life. There is a very strong rationale behind why we're, we're doing what we're doing and, in fact, the necessity of doing it. Um, one could argue the ethical issue backward that it is the job of a scientist, not only a good idea, to push the limit of science. And uh, history has shown us over and over again over thousands of years 
that when there is a disagreement between the scientific approach and, and the public opinion uh, or the social political interface, usually time takes care of it and science prevails. So this was one of those cases. The second issue that became controversial was now that we have those human cells and we can make them do pretty much what we want them to do, uh, making brains, for example, or uh, any other organ that you like, and we're doing all those things in the context of a petri dish. So we are in an artificial world that kind of mimics life, but has really nothing to do with real life. Real life is, we're sitting here with the audience, and this is what real life is. How are we going to test the validity of what we discover in a petri dish in the context of an organismal background? Obviously, we're not going to put those cells back into a human being and watch how they behave. And uh, so we started a series of discussion at Rockefeller again, where set up the basis of generating a platform where we can measure the activity and uh, the function of human cells that we generate and differentiate from human embryos in the lab in a context of a surrogate system. So we use the mouse embryo as a surrogate to transplant human cells into the mouse embryo for transient period of times and watch the human cells perform in an in vivo situation, so in, in, in real life situation. And um, it's mind blowing because if you had asked me at the beginning, is this ever going to work, I would have said, I don't think so. There is 50 million years of difference between a mouse and human and, and mouse embryonic cells and human embryonic cells never come together, even in New York City, that I <laughs> can't think of. And yet when you mingle them, and you, when you mix them, they get along perfectly fine and the human cells actually contribute to the mouse anatomy uh, and to functional output of that anatomy. The amazing thing, and I'm going to end with this, is um, you know, obviously, that mouse gestation is very fast. It's three weeks, 21 days. For us, it's obviously nine months. So there is a timing issue here about how we're going to synchronize this. And amazingly, the discovery is that the human cells actually follow the rhythm of the host and not where they come from. So for the first time, you start seeing acceleration of development, a, a brain that normally takes postnatal time frames to wire itself is actually wiring within two weeks' time. So um, the definition of what regulates temporal output in biology is still up in the air. And at least for us, I think it represents the next frontier. And I expect um, confrontation again, and I expect debate. But I honestly believe that this is the right thing to do at this moment. It's awesome. It's groundbreaking work. And the the, the chimera makes me think, it, it seems like a good metaphor for thinking about the ways that science reaches out to other disciplines. And um, I, it's a question for all of you, but what what's your sense of how science right now is bridging gaps with, with other fields? And how are other fields bridging gap with science? What are, what are some of the, the challenges you've faced? And I will say, uh, if you have any questions, we'll have a little bit of time for questions after this. So uh, we have about 10 minutes left. So and to me, the boundaries are getting fuzzier and fuzzier between science, art, visual arts, graphic arts. I think we're all aiming at the same target. We're all trying to push the limit of what we know and the way we can express it beyond what the regular boundaries are. And uh, within science itself, we have seen this. There used to be departments in science called zoology or taxonomy. And, those departments really don't exist. Molecular biology now is taking over biology in general. The fusion between biophysics, physics, and biological system has started about 50 years ago and is going maximum speed. Chemistry was never really detached from biology, so they're coming back with biochemistry. And so from, from inside of the science, as much as from the interface of science with other fields, um, there is no more boundaries. Uh, the reality of the fact of scientists contributing to architecture education and having graduate students, surprisingly I have more graduate students in the architecture department than I have in my science lab, is already telling you that the uh, frontiers are blurred. And we can learn from each other in ways that I think in the past we were maybe a little bit more rigid uh, to cross the kind of boundaries that we need to cross if we're going to make a synergistic output. And nowadays, you know, thanks to new technology, telecommunication, the ease that we have to communicate with one another, all these frontiers are, are completely vanishing in front of my eyes. I just had, a, this is like, <laughs> I haven't said this out loud, but I just had this vision, seeing your work and hearing what you were just saying. Like, basically the data that you're pulling, <clears throat> what if it, and I don't think this is that far off, where students 
or could be studying a scientific problem and literally all the data would be there and they could like press a button and be like, be like visualize exactly what it is. So that the power, the computing power to kind of show the science on the fly. I mean, that would be so exciting. I think that's what's actually originally got me into writing computer software was being inspired by people like Casey Reese and Gold Levin and Ben Fry who are writing simulation-based software where you can come up with these simple rules, which is you know the same same principles you're learning in physics and yeah. everything else, and actually being able to visualize that and turn that into something you can experiment with and understand and also communicate. And I think when I think about communication and even thought, I kind of think of it as actually storytelling. And then it's not actually like a discrete separation between science and art and everything else, but actually a spectrum. And, and in reality, uh, there's lots of tools that we can use, like mathematics, that decrease subjectivity. But ultimately, there's a clear spectrum of storytelling. Uh, and, and there's really just a subjectivity index where you can say, well, this is something we can all agree upon. because. But ultimately, we're really. Well, like a story is just a vessel. I've always, always felt like a story is a vessel for an idea. So if like. You suddenly have the computing power to visualize all these ideas, yeah. and you can kind of wrap them into these stories. I mean, the power of that would be great. Um, any questions from the audience? And also, guys, I, I have some M&Ms here. <laughs> so, Thank you. This is Google, after all. How many weeks did it take the uh, the mouse that implanted the human brain to start talking? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the reason you have um, uh, a very long-term debates and discussion and you welcome all the opinions of all kind of uh, point of views is exactly to define what is the limit that you can do an experiment without offending the society or a given cultural sets of belief. And so the way this was defined in 2002, 2003, which is now um, part of the National Academy of Science rules of ethics in this kind of chimeric experimentation is that the input cannot be more than 1%. So uh, and if, if the experiments are done very early, where the embryo is just a ball of cells of about 100 cells in the case of the mouse, then you can only provide one single cell input. And of course, that cell would go ahead and differentiate, and the progeny in the daughter cells would contribute to different organs at different times. But that remains a very, very small number. Now, things have changed since 2006, because once you show that you can get that program to work, uh, now the expansion is about 15% of inputs from graph to host. This is still very far from having a mouse that is, uh, will talk to you, unfortunately. <laughs> I would love to listen to a mouse talking to me. Uh, <laughs> I would like to ask him, well, how is it to be a mouse? But um, you, should, you should ask Disney for some funding. I will, I will. <laughs> but just to follow up on, uh, on that point is um, the rules are now, if you do those transplantations early, people get offended because you know, those cells can give rise to everything. But as you do the transplantations later and later in time, then it's much more comfortable. So there are not techniques where you can use a human embryonic stem cell, push it toward becoming a brain or telencephalic type of cell grafted within the region of the mouse in utero inside. And the rules are that you can actually allow the mouse to be born. And you can measure the, not only the contribution of the cell to the anatomy and the circuitry, but perhaps the contribution of the cell to the way a mouse behaves cognitively. And there is one example, it's not from my work, but from a colleague um, that started using the technology that was developed at Rockefeller originally, but at later and later times, where a group of neurons called astrocytes, it doesn't matter, are transplanted into the forebrain of the mouse. And with 15% contribution, the mouse is behaving differently than its sibling. And there is one very good sample test, is fear conditioning test, where you associate a sensory stimuli to a motor response. And it takes a mouse usually 20 times to figure out that when the sensory input comes, there will be a motor response. In the case of the mouse camera with the human astrocyte, it takes only two times for the mouse to learn. So there are differences cognitively that you can measure, but I think with an input of about 10 15%, everybody, including ourselves, are very careful about how far you push this experiment. Go for it. Uh, hello. So when we're dealing with uh, the communication of science, whether it's trying to visualize, communicate, or 
form a better debate about the ethics of science, uh, we tend to turn towards mediums that interpret scientific papers for us, uh, whether it's like pop science or we have uh, data visualizations or shows. Uh, but we see the original medium of science communica communication doesn't seem to change. Uh, I would like to ask all three of you, if, if you're able to give an answer, uh, what you believe might be what um, keeps us kind of stuck to this old idea of scientific communication and why the scientific paper in of itself uh, is not evolving to make it more understandable. So uh, this is a great question. It's really probably one of the most significant questions that we're gonna address tonight. And I think uh, is one of the reasons I'm actually here. Um, the way scientists communicate information to the public is not adequate. You're absolutely right that scientists talk among themselves. Scientists talk to scientists. They publish in forums that are very highly sophisticated, yeah. extremely technical, completely beyond the reach of anybody who otherwise is extremely smart, but not endowed with the jargon that you require to decipher what the meaning is. I even suffer this in my own lab when I collaborate with people from other fields, physics and others, and sometimes it's hard for us to have a dialogue and, and trust me that we know each other's uh, jargon. So it's impossible for uh, somebody outside of science to be able to have this communication. This is extremely dangerous, uh, not only for scientists, but for the society as a whole, I believe. Because if that communication doesn't occur, um, and if the quality of it is not good enough, then the only thing the public is left with to learn about scientific discoveries and significance is the mass media. And if you see the way Hollywood and the mass media are portraying scientists, it's really scary. And I think one of the reasons that I really admire what Alexi does with Imagine Science is that he actually comes from a scientific background. He got his PhD at Rockefeller. And he realized very quickly that this is a major gap that needs to be filled immediately before things go completely south. So I think we're all trying, or trying our best. It's not very easy uh, for me to be sitting down here or to teach architecture to students at Columbia. But I really think it's not only a good idea. It's my job to do it. And, and if scientists don't do that, we're actually condemning ourselves to complete isolation and at some point to irrelevance. So you are absolutely right. Scientific journals are not doing a good job conveying the scientific information to the public. Some scientists, I like to believe more and more, are trying to get up and, and make it happen. But we also count very much on colleagues from the graphic world, from the movie industry, to make a special effort to connect. And what you saw tonight, it's a great beginning, it's a great step forward of trying to provide scientific information with a language that's not too scary. Can I ask the other two panelists, what are some, maybe some examples of, of ways we can break out of the, the typical regime that we, that we have today of the internet, articles, even visualizations? I guess I would start by saying first that there's obviously a lot immense value in the established processes that have led to scientific progress, so I don't mean to bash that. But, but I think there's also just fundamentally in terms of the bigger picture, there's some issues with the incentives to be esoteric in the scientific world. Uh, and the motivation, uh, the intellectual property aspects and the, the tenure track process, which isn't always as communal and probably possibly prolific. Um, but uh, ultimately, oftentimes with science, you are dealing with incredibly uh, esoteric concepts and, and niche things. Um, I think what I've been really excited about is when you take that out of its context or to come up with a way of communicating, you can bridge gaps that lead to completely different types of applications and different types of thinking. So. Um, I, to, to answer your question, I think um, for me, actually, you need a combination of things. You need a, a cherry, which is usually a concise video or piece of media that can provide that science fiction uh, inspiration and engagement. I mean, a lot of it, well, the work that I do is even just pointing out how freaking amazing this stuff is, like the complex infrastructural systems around us and stuff we take for granted on a daily basis. But I think you need that carrot, and then you need the deeper dive. I think a lot of stuff online is lacking that. You get the inspiration bit, and then you can't dig deeper and actually understand it at a fundamental level. Um, so I hope that it's not a polarization where we're just going to see one or the other, but that we actually pair those two things intelligently. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I guess like when Fold It happened a couple years ago, which you know engaged. How many of you know Fold It with the University of Washington, and they d made a 
DNA strand for AIDS, like a game, and invited the world to do an online participation. And it was very exciting, and they, in 10 days, discovered something that the scientists hadn't been able to discover. And I love that they took one aspect of a problem and opened it up to the public. And I think th those kind of ideas of, of taking one aspect that is accessible and figuring out a way to engage the public, and then I agree with you, have the follow-up to explain the bigger context of what they're doing is really important. I, like th I, I think we have to wrap it up. So, bo Okay, well, yeah. um, thanks, for, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, thanks to the Imagine Science Film Festival. And um, to Google and follow us at Motherboard. And thank you most of all to our panel, Ali, Aaron, and Tiffany, for being here and talking about the future of storytelling. It's great. Uh, there's a reception, so the discussion continues uh, upstairs. It's on the eighth floor. Uh, again, thank you so much to the panelists, to Alex. And tomorrow, tomorrow night, there's a screening, a live edit uh, film that's editing as you're watching it. It's going to be at the Museum of the Moving Image. It's once, and then you won't be able to see it ever again. So Museum of the Moving Image tomorrow night, and uh, the festival continues all week. And thank you so much, guys. That was, that was really uh, amazing. So thank you.